Hello and welcome to chapter 6.4 from Stevens' Introduction to Statistics, the Think and Do book. And this is the chapter called the Central Limit Theorem, a very important theorem that will persist throughout the rest of the book. And so I, what I want to do is set this up with a preliminary example, right? All right, so we'll say the good people at Fizzy Pop, big company out of, uh, well, it's a made-up company. Um, they claim that the mean volume of soda in all 12-ounce cans of soda is 12 ounces, right? That would be nice. It's labeled 12 ounces, so we'd expect, you know, there's some variation, but the mean should be 12 ounces. So they claim that the mean of all the cans is 12 ounces, and there's a standard deviation of 0.5 ounces. And so not every can weighs has exactly 12 ounces, but on average they weigh 12 ounces and um, the standard deviation is 0.5. If you were to select one can of soda and get 11.85 ounces, right? that's below the 12 on the label so you'd be a little upset, uh, but it's not that far below and you probably wouldn't find it that unusual. right? However, if you selected 100 cans of soda and you actually got the weights of all 100 and averaged those and the mean from those 100 cans is 11.85. That's a little more incriminating because, they're a little more unusual certainly because you took 100 cans, some should be above, some should be below, but if the population mean is truly uh, 12 ounces, then your sample from 100 should probably be about 12 ounces and you came up with 11.85. So that certainly seems more unusual than getting just one can that weighs 11.85 ounces. So here we're going to ask how much more unusual is that, right? And the central limit theorem will help us evaluate that question. So I'm going to go into full screen mode here and talk about the central limit theorem, right? So there's some imagining that uh, you must do, right? We're going to start with some parent population, some population, whatever it is, maybe all cans of fizzy pop. And it has, that population has a mean, and it has a standard deviation, right? U and sigma. Now suppose you start taking, suppose you take a sample. You're going to take one sample of size n, whatever, 100. And we're going to calculate its mean. That's a sample mean, so it's x bar. Now you're going to do this over and over. Then you're going to take another sample of that same size and get the mean from that. And again and again until you've done this for every possible sample. And in the previous section we had a population that had a total of three so it wasn't that hard. But it's, it, it will generally be impossible. That's why this is sort of imagining, right? So, but pretend we took every possible size, um, every possible sample of size n and we got the means. At that point we would have a collection of sample means. I mean, we'd have an awful lot of them. And the distribution of these means, so you have all these sample means, a whole bunch of them. The distribution of these means is called the sampling distribution of the mean. And we did that in chapter um, 6.3, the previous section, but we only had uh, three elements in our population, so it was easy and we could see them. In general, you can't list out all of these. But if you could, the means of all these sample means... Um, sorry, we'd collect all the means of all these samples and that would create the sampling distribution of the mean. Right. Now, you could calculate the mean of all those sample means and we will denote that by mu sub x bar. What that is, is the mean of all sample means. And that's why it has that funny notation. Mu is the mean, the population mean, of all of the sample means. That's the sub x bar, the x bars are the sample means. And you would also get a standard deviation for those sample means, and we'll denote that with a sigma sub x bar. And what you would find is that the mean of the means, and I said this in the last section, the mean of the sample means is equal to the population mean. That's what this says right here. And that's good. Right? But 
the standard deviation of the sample means is not the standard deviation of the population. It is actually the standard deviation of the population, this thing, divided by the square root of n. Right? So while the mean of the sample means is equal to the population mean, the standard deviation of the means is not equal to the population standard deviation. You have to divide by the square root of n. Uh, what you would also find is that even if the parent population wasn't normally distributed, this sampling distribution of the mean would be approximately normal. And that's going to be very handy. Right? That, that distribution of sample means would be normal, or at least close to normal. And um, the larger your sample size, the closer to normal um, that distribution would be. So that's all great. That took some imagination and then some trust in these two formulas that I give you. Um, so in practice, what that means when dealing with probabilities regarding sample means, if the sample size is sufficiently large, and we'll worry about that later, we won't need the parent population to be normally distributed. That's nice because in order to use that chart, the normal distribution chart, the z-table, we needed to know that the original distribution was normal. But now, if we're dealing with the sample and the sample size, we don't necessarily need the parent population to be normally distributed. Um, the mean of all the sample means is equal to the population mean. That is also nice. Uh, but the standard deviation of the sample means is not equal to the standard deviation of the population. That's where we take the population standard deviation divided by the square root of n. And so what that means is that when you convert a sample mean to a z-score, so converting a sample mean to a z-score, we use this formula here. And it should look somewhat familiar to you because in the section 6.2, we had z equals x minus mu over sigma. And these are just a ver this is just a variation of this. Only now we're talking about a sample mean. So we get an x bar. And then we're talking about the mean from the sample mean, so mu sub x bar, over the standard deviation from the sample means. Right? And then what we use, we use the fact that this right here population mean is equal to the mean of the sample means, so that's nice. And then the standard deviation of the sample means is the population standard deviation divided by the square root of n. So essentially our old formula for z, which was z equals x minus mu over sigma, now becomes x bar minus mu over sigma divided by the square root of n. So that's the big difference right there. You're taking the population standard deviation and dividing by the square root of n. So let's go back to our preliminary example. Right? And again, they claim that the mean amount of soda in all 12 ounce cans of soda is 12 ounces. So they claim that the mean equals 12 and that the standard deviation is 0.5, so sigma equals 0.5. Now, we'll take the first problem, which actually doesn't require anything from this chapter. If you grab one can, randomly select one can of soda, what is the probability that it contains 11.85 or fewer fluid ounces? All right. I guess earlier I was talking about weights. So at this point, we're talking about um, volumes, ounces. 11.85 or fewer. So the idea is we want the probability that a single can, X, has less than 11.85 fluid ounces. So when we draw our normal graph, our normal distribution curve, we have x has a mean of 12, as claimed by the company. And I want the probability of me grabbing one can and getting less than or equal to 11.85. So we have to convert this 11.85 to a z-score. So again, we use the um, the, let's see, the formula from chapter 6.2, we get 11.85, which is the x value, minus 12, which is the mean, over the standard deviation. So we get negative 0.3. So the probability of getting a can 
that has less than 11.85 ounces is equal to the probability of a z-score being less than negative 0.3. And this we get from the table. All right, so we're going to look for negative 0 0.3 in the table. Negative 0 0.3. And it's negative 0 0.30, so it's this first one. 0.3821. Three point eight two one. So this area, this, or this probability, point three eight two one. So basically, what that says is about thirty eight percent of the cans are going to have a weight below eleven point eight five ounces anyway. So the fact that I got a can, or you got a can that weighed eleven point eight five ounces, that's not very unusual, right? Because we'd expect thirty eight percent of them to be eleven point eight five or fewer anyway. But now let's look at the second part of that preliminary example. And we ask, what is the probability of getting a sample of 100 cans with a mean of 11.85 or fewer ounces? So what we're doing is we want, the f we want to find the probability that x bar, notice that's no longer an x, that's an x bar, that's a sample mean less than 11.85. And so the only big difference between this problem and the previous one just before it is that now instead of using z equals x minus mu over sigma, we use the formula on the previous page. And really the only difference is this dividing by the square root of n. So there's our sample mean minus the population mean over the population standard deviation divided by the square root of n. And when you get that, you get a z-score of negative 3.00. So the probability of getting a sample mean, notice this axis here represents sample means. The probability of getting a sample mean less than 11.85 here is the same as getting a z-score less than negative 3.00. So when we look that up in the table, we're looking for negative 3.00 that's here. And zero, zero, one, three. Much smaller. So this area is actually point zero, zero, one, three. So if you had a sample mean that came in at 11.85, that's pretty unusual because you'd expect, you know, about one-tenth of one percent of such samples to have a mean of 11.85 or four fewer ounces. Right, so that 11.85 is much more extreme than it was when you were just taking one can. Right? And so what's the difference? The difference in calculating these two from A to B, there's very little difference except that in, if there's only one selection, one can, I get my z-score from this formula. If there's a sample of size n, then my z-score comes from this formula. So you can't forget to divide the population standard deviation by the square root of n to get your z-score. All right, so let's do some your turn problems. Popular problem that goes along with this um, section. So we have an elevator that states there is a 2,100 pound weight limit or 10 people. And the question we're asking here is, what is the probability that when you get 10 people on the elevator that it's going to exceed that weight limit, right? And um, the idea that and this thing's going to, that you exceed the weight limit, you exceed the weight limit if your sample of 10 has a mean bigger than um, 210. So if my sample mean is bigger than 210, then the, then the total weight is going to be 2100. So if you have a sample mean greater than 210, you've got a problem, right? You're over the weight limit. So we're going to consider two different scenarios. If just random selection of 10 people get on the elevator and a random selection of 10 adult men get on the elevator. So here's what we'll do. We'll think of, we'll get some data the internet, basically, the weights of adults are normally distributed with a mean of 165. 
and a standard deviation of 35. So that's adults, right? But adult men, the mean is 191, and the standard deviation is 28. Right, so obviously the adult men way more on average than adults in general, and that's standard reason because men are um, heavier than women in general. Okay, so we want to find the probability that a full elevator, 10 people, will exceed the weight limit. And again, as I mentioned up there in blue, this will happen if the mean weight of the 10 people is greater than 210. So in the first case, I ask, calculate the probability that a random selection of 10 adults, right, adults is important, has a mean weight greater than 210. So I draw my normal distribution, right? Only now I'm not talking about an x value, I'm talking about a mean, a sample mean, an x bar. Right, so notice that's x bar, no longer x. So there's the average, or the mean, of all adults, right? And we want to find out what's the probability of getting a mean of 210 or higher. So we're looking for that probability, right? And so to do that, we have to convert our x bar, 210, right, that's this, into a z-score. And we do that, 210 x bar minus mu over sigma, which is 35, divided by the square root of n. All right, because in this case, um, mu for all people is 165. That's the mean weight. The standard deviation is 35. And I do have a sample size of 10. So that's where I get this 4.07. So the probability that I get a sample mean greater than 210 is equal to the probability that I get a z above 4.07. And so if you look at the probability, and by the way, the table gives me areas to the left. So if I want an area to the right like this, I have to take 1 minus the area to the left. So if I look up 4.07 in the table, right there, that's a positive value. I go way down, I get down to here, and I see that it doesn't go up to 4.07, but I have this. If I have a z-score bigger than 3.5, use the error equals 0.9999. And the further your value is above 3.5, the more 9s you get here. The, the closer this gets to 1, right? So at 4.07, I've got a lot of 0.9s going on. But we'll use 0.9999. So there it is right there. I subtract that from 1. I have 0 0.0001. So the probability of getting a sample of size 10 of just adults with a mean weight greater than 210 is pretty small. And in fact, since this value is actually bigger than 0.999, the actual probability is less than 0 0.0001. So less than 1 one-hundredth of a percent. You still want, might not like that as far as exceeding elevator limits, but it's pretty small. But notice what happens if you get 10 men on the elevator. Calculate the probability that a random selection of 10 adult men has a mean weight greater than 210 pounds. So basically, the graph looks exactly the same, only my mean is no longer 165, it's 191, right? So I calculate my z-score, x bar minus mu over sigma divided by the square root of n. And when I plug that into my calculator, I get 2.15. So this value of z is 2.15. So the probability that x bar is bigger than 210 is the same as the probability that z is greater than 2.15. And again, the table doesn't give um, areas to the right, it gives areas to the left. So I find the area to the left right here and subtract that from 1. So when I look up 2.15 in the table, 2.1, so I'm in this row, 1, 5, I'm in this column, 0.9842. Right? I go back. 0.9842. I subtract that from 1, 
I get 0 0.0158, which if you convert that to a decimal is about 1.6%. So basically it's saying about 1.6% of the time that a random selection of 10 adult men get on the elevator, the, the mean will be greater than 210 and the weight limit will be exceeded. And if this was some sort of risk, like cable snapping risk, that's way too high. You know, if you own a hotel or something, eventually that's going to happen. Um, so while that weight limit, or the, uh, the number of adults may be appropriate for just random adults, it is certainly risky if you have an elevator full of men. Right. So that's the first your turn. The second your turn. Um, later in the course, we'll talk about hypothesis tests, and this sort of heads us down this direction. Um, suppose I breed and sell beef cattle. Right? So I sell cattle, and um, I claim that my cow's weights, when fully mature, are normally distributed with a mean of 1,400 pounds, standard deviation of 250 pounds. So you like that? That seems like a good uh, good crop of cows. And so you buy 50 of my cows. And the mean weight of the cows that you bought is only 1,300 pounds. And you're thinking, oh, I feel a little ripped off. You told me the mean was 1,400 and my mean was 1,300. So it's significantly below the 1,400. Actually, we'll talk about what significance means in a minute. Uh, but it's certainly below 1,400. And you're sort of asking yourself, is that strange? How strange is that? Were you lying to me, or did I just get unlucky? Um, so what we want to do is we want to calculate the probability of getting 50 cows with a mean weight less than 130, or sorry, 1300. So basically, if I do my normal curve, I'm looking for the probability of getting a sample mean that's less than 1300 whenever the population mean is 1400. So I'll believe you temporarily that the mean of all the cattle are um, 1,400. Or I guess you'll believe me. And then you'll calculate this probability. And if this probability is super small, you might have good reason to believe that I'm not telling the truth. Okay, so let's calculate that probability. We have to convert our sample mean 1,300 to a z-score. And we use sample mean 1,300 minus the population mean that I said was the case, 1400, over the population standard deviation, which is 250, divided by the square root of n, which is 50. When we do that, you get a z-score of negative 2.83. So the probability that my sample mean is less than 1300 is equal to the probability that I get a z-score less than negative 2.83. So this is negative 2.83. So let's find that probability. We go back to the table and we're looking for negative 2.83. I have to go to the negative. Uh, negative 2.83. Let's erase that. Negative 2.83. So I'm pretty far uh, away from what I expect there. So 0.0023. So the probability of randomly selecting 50 cows with a mean of less than 1,300 pounds is pretty small. That's, you know, 0.2%. So I'm way down there. If, if what you're telling me is, or sorry, you're way down there because I sold you the cows. I keep forgetting. So you would have pretty good reason to believe that um, I was not telling the truth about that 1,400 because... If I was, you either sold me the smallest cows in your lot, or maybe I got extremely unlucky. Maybe your statistics was off, or um, there is a chance that, you know, maybe I was lying. Maybe that whole 1,400, I was exaggerating with that. So this is how you can sort of get to the truth of matters um, using, the, uh, using some statistics. And particularly in this case, we are using the central limit theorem. So I wanted to get back to that page, but it's too far back. All right, so the central limit theorem allowed us to, um, to sort of gauge 
you know, how unusual that situation was. And we'll get more into this in chapter 6. Wait, no, we're in chapter 6. Chapter 8. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so there's some details of the central limit theorem that I glazed over earlier, and I'll go through fairly briefly now. Um, first, if the parent population is normally distributed, right, then the sampling distribution of the mean is definitely normally distributed, right? Because remember I said as the sample size gets bigger, the sampling distribution of the mean gets closer to being normal. Um, but if it starts off normal, then any sample size will work. If the population is not normally distributed, then as n, the sample size gets bigger, and the sampling distribution of the mean gets more and more normal. Um, there's a correction factor that I don't necessarily want to get into, but it's basically a correction factor for calculating sigma over the square, um, s sigma um, of the standard, uh, the standard deviation of the distribution of sample means. So it's a little correction factor um, that we generally in ignore. You need it whenever you're sampling without replacement, and often we are sampling without replacement. So it might be a good idea, but it complicates uh, the calculations enormously. So we're going to ignore the correction factor. And that's totally valid, especially if your population is large. Okay, so convention for sample size. So going back to this one. Let's read this again. If the parent population is not normally distributed, then n, the sample size, increases. If this increases, the sampling distribution of the mean becomes normal. When we say becomes normal, what does that mean? You know, because I want to use that table. I want to use my normal distribution. And I want to know if that's valid or not. And so the convention for the minimum sample size, if the original population is not normally distributed, we generally require a sample of size 30 or more. If the parent population is already normally distributed, any sample size is sufficient. So this 30, you see this 30 regularly, and um, you know if the if the parent population is far from normal, if it's very skewed or maybe bimodal, you might need more than 30. But 30, 30 is sort of the conventional benchmark for sufficiency. Okay, so examples of when the central limit theorem applies. So we're going to use, we're going to set up scenarios here, and sometimes because you can't always use the central limit theorem, you know we can't always use that normal table. Um, so this will demonstrate when you can, when you can. So suppose I have a, po a population, a parent population, mean of 100, and a standard deviation of 10, and you take every sample of size n from this population. And for the first case, we'll say n is 16. So that's less than 30, so that's a little risky. But we're assuming the parent population is normally distributed. So the first part, what is the mean and standard deviation of the distribution of sample means? Again, the mean of the sample means is equal to the population mean. So that's still good. The standard deviation of the distribution of the sample means is equal to the population standard deviation divided by the square root of n. So there I get 2.5. So that's good. The big question I want to ask, will the sampling distribution of the mean be normally distributed? Well, the sample size is kind of small, but I'm assuming the apparent population is normally distributed. So the answer is yes. So that's good. Right? It's a small sample, but my parent population was normally distributed. So, it, so the distribution of sample means will also be normally distributed. Now suppose the population was not normally distributed. You need a sample size of 64, so that's good. That's a nice big sample. What is the mean of the sampling distribution of the means? Well, that's still 100. The standard deviation, now that gets a little smaller, right? The standard deviation of the sampling distribution of the means is this here, the population standard deviation divided by the square root of n. But since n got bigger, my standard deviation of the sample means got smaller. And the big question, will the sampling distribution of the mean be normally distributed? Well, it's bad that the parent population was not normally distributed, but my sample size was bigger than 30. 
So that's good. And I will say essentially yes. We can't be certain if it's perfectly normal because we don't know how bad off the original population was. But since I have a sample size greater than 30, I will assume that it's normal enough. So here comes the one case where it, where it doesn't work out. Suppose the parent population is not normally distributed and you have a sample of size 16. Again, the sample, the, the mean of the sample means is still the parent population mean. So that doesn't change. The standard deviation of the sample means is kind of big again because my sample size is a little smaller. So I'm back to uh, 2.5 here. Those don't change. What changes is this, the results to this question. Will the sampling distribution of the mean be normally distributed? And the problem here is the parent population was not normally distributed. And my sample size was less than 30. So that's sort of the two strikes in your out system. So the sampling distribution will not necessarily be normal. Because the sample size is too small and the parent population is not normally distributed. So you get the idea that you can always apply this um, central limit theorem and use the z-score. But, but what this demonstrates is that while that, that is the case, especially in a textbook where we're working on these types of problems, you know, you'll be able to do all the problems. But out in the real world, there are things to be careful about. And the thing to be careful about is a small sample size when the parent population is not known to be normally distributed. All right, so that wraps up this section. And um, I will see you, or you will hear from me again from in Chapter 6.5. So we're good. Have a good day. Bye.